traditional lands of the Western Abenaki peoples. And we have an obligation living on these lands to do what we can do to end the continued destruction caused by the climate and environmental crisis we have brought about. Before we get started with today's program, we want you to be alert We want to alert representatives of climate and social justice organizations in attendance that toward the end of today's address, we will be inviting you to come up and give a one minute synopsis of your organization. Please be prepared to come up when we alert you at this moment. Pandemonium information for the rest of the day will be given at the end of this address. You can use your pots and bangers for applause during this address as practice. And let's try them out right now to let the governor to give the people state of the state address. Here on the state house steps, we will tell the truth about the climate and ecological emergency and demand that our elected officials join us in this declaration. Our goal today is to join together to continue to build a people powered movement for a just transition. All over the world, In the United States and right here in Vermont, we are seeing daily evidence of this crisis. Most recently, we have seen flooding in Jakarta, Indonesia, with people suffering and dying as the country makes plans to move their capital city to higher ground. We have seen apocalyptic brush fires in Australia and record temperatures with homes destroyed, people displaced, and half a billion animals dead. We have seen enormous fires in the Amazon rainforest. We have seen Hurricane Dorian stalling over the Bahamas for 40 hours. We have seen record thawing of our glaciers, including in the Arctic and Antarctic. Right here in the United States, we have seen catastrophic California wildfires, followed by torrential rains and mudslides. We have seen record setting floods in the upper Midwest and devastating hurricanes in Puerto Rico, Houston, and Florida. In Vermont, we have regular flash flooding, frequent high wind events, skyrocketing tick populations, increased mold and algae problems, and much warmer and variable winters. The list of climate-related disasters is very long. In November 2018, the IPCC reported that to avoid the worst effects of the rapidly accelerating climate crisis, we require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. In 2019, numerous peer-reviewed papers published findings that suggest the models that were used to make recommendations in the IPCC report were significantly underestimating the pace of climate change. Despite these grave warnings and the endless stream of climate disasters, it would appear that Governor Scott thinks all we need to do is get a few more Vermonters to switch to driving electric cars. Governor Scott claims to support the Paris Climate Agreement. He boasts about his creation of the Vermont Climate Action Commission and his collaboration with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and other regional partners, but his actions speak louder than his words. These past three years, his actions have been severely lacking. 
and all evidence. And all evidence suggests that Governor Scott's lack of urgent action will continue through the 2020 legislature session. And so today, we demand that Governor Scott and the Vermont legislature, number one, stand behind universally accepted climate science and tell the truth at every opportunity about our state of climate emergency. Number two, support, support the Vermont Youth Climate Congress's demand for significantly more aggressive targets than what is stated in the Paris Climate Agreement. Number three, ban a new fossil fuel infrastructure projects. Number four, provide a mechanism for direct public empowerment so that policies and responses to a changing climate can be developed and implemented locally. And number five, support a just transition, which focuses on frontline communities and prioritizes racial justice, economic justice, environmental justice, regenerative agriculture, indigenous rights, so we have invited a number of speakers today to address different aspects of the crisis we are in. But before we move on to the speakers, let's observe a moment of silence to acknowledge the victims of the climate disaster. All living things on earth, but especially those that have died or lost their homes and habitats. Thank you. Uh, today's first speaker is Sam Peterson, a student at Hanover High School and member of Rise Up, Rise Upper Valley. Thank you all for coming out on this absolutely freezing day. It's a very important movement, so I'm really glad to see you guys all out here. Um, so one of the biggest things that we need to focus on is that this is a youth driven action and this movement needs to recognize that. 13 years ago, legislation was passed for 75% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions by 2028. This past year, we were told by Peter Walk that we will not be meeting that goal. That is because there is no enforcement in that policy that guaranteed that we will be making these um, changes. We are tired of these empty promises that we are constantly hearing about and being told. This is not a bipartisan issue. This is an issue. The only question in front of us is whether we get serious now and pass real, real legislation with real enforcement, with real change in our society or stand by as we watch toothless legislation be passed just so that um, just so that legislators can pat themselves on the back while our world is falling apart. We need to stop our legislators from protecting our economy and the economic gains of a few over our environment. So we stand out here to make a choice, a choice of where we are going to stand in this history. Your choice is to be a passive observer in this world of crisis where we let these legislators continue to just to put us down or to fight to preserve the one thing that we all share. We also need to recognize the people who are most affected by this, which includes people of color. And these are the people in our communities who are constantly being overlooked. So stand with us to fight for our world. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sam. Um, our next speaker, uh, Rachel Smoker, is a biologist and a lifelong activist. She is currently co-directing co-director of Biofuel Watch, an international organization focused on land use, biodiversity, energy, and climate. She has been active over the past several years in opposing Vermont's gas ANGP fracked gas pipeline as a member of Protect Gibrags Park. Here she is. <laughs> Thanks everybody. It is really great to see all these people and it's great to have Extinction Rebellion organizing in our state and to see the youth movements that are rising up and people really starting to mobilize around climate change. We've Some of us who've been doing this for a few decades have been saddened by the lack of action. We just had our 25th COP, right? And nothing has happened in 25 years of meeting in the UN it's time for us to give up on that process and start focusing on our communities and within our state, right? Yeah. We can make progress. We need to work where we can be effective. And this is one of the places that we can do that. Let's do it. So I have sort of, I have sort of three points that I feel I have to keep saying. One is, you know, we're, we're getting better and better at declaring this emergency because it's becoming very obvious to everyone that we are faced with an emergency. It, we've seen catastrophes right, left, and center in front of us, but to solve this crisis, we have to do a magic trick, which is basically sort of like climbing four mountains at once, both frontwards and backwards, because we have people in our country, in our community, who still think that climate change is a hoax. There's one mountain we've got to climb up and over and around, and we have to make it clear that we are not gonna let them stand in the way. So we need to declare that it's an emergency, but then we need to realize that declaring an emergency opens up doors and opportunities to people who would use this emergency for their own profiteering. Right? As co-director of Biofuel Watch, I'm really familiar with that because we've been fighting what was put forward as a climate solution, right? Biofuels, let's burn corn in our car engines. That was a really dumb idea and we fought it from the get-go. And it was always awkward to be standing there amongst people who recognized that climate changes was a problem but didn't think critically about what the solutions should be. And there are so many purveyors of false solutions all over the place. And one of the ones in our state right now that we're facing is Vermont Gas. Yes. After, after installing their reckless, shoddy, unbelievably dangerous pipeline through our state, taking people's lands, they are now have the gall to say that they are going to become carbon neutral. Tell me, how do you make methane carbon neutral? So we need to fight and climb that mountain frontwards, backwards, center, every which way we possibly can. We cannot be misled misinformed, distracted. We need effective actions and we need them now. We don't have time to wait. We're not gonna get a second chance. This is it. We need to recognize in Vermont, for example, that we have a lot of our energy coming from Quebec, for where they have been damming rivers and taking over indigenous people's territories and poisoning their uh, their uh, foodscapes with mercury in, in Muskrat Falls and elsewhere. Um, and, and another large portion of our energy. It, anyway, we've got a lot of dirty energy coming into our state. The thing is, energy is not the only issue, right? We've got transportation, we've got heating, we've got everything, right? Naomi Klein said it. Yep. Climate change is about everything. It's about human rights, right? <laughs> We have a universal 
Declar declaration of human rights that recognizes our right to basic basic rights right it does not say that you can get filthy rich at the expense of life on this planet and drive everyone and everything into extinction so that you can get more and more rich that is not a right some of our legislators may tell us that it's too costly and it won't pass and we can't pass possibly get this legislation through well we have plenty of very wealthy people in this state who have not paid their share in taxes. And some of them probably would even be okay with that idea if they have any heart for Vermont and for Vermonters. And if they don't, move out of the state if you don't like it. This is a good state full of good people, community-minded and, and capable of taking care of ourselves. We need to let our legislators know we are going to be here, right? It's not enough for us to stand up here and say, hey, it's an emergency, do something. We have to stand behind them, we have to support them, we have to go to our communities, we have to be bold and demand bold steps and, and, and uh, play our part in making these things happen. We can't just ask them to do it because we will have... We will get a plate full of false solutions and we will find ourselves rolling back down all of those mountains that we've been trying to climb. So let's work hard. Let's get that ban on fossil fuel infrastructure into the forefront, right? Let's tell our legislators, we're here, we're watching, we're holding you accountable. 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 All right. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, our next speaker, David Van Dusen, is president of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. So what I want to talk to you about today is Green New Deal. Yeah! <laughs> But while we're talking about Green New Deal, right, that's not only about creating new, good, uh, green, renewable energy. That is also about good paying union jobs. It is about a generation of blue collar working people who are going to find good, meaningful work through this social process of recreating our economy. And as we strive to create environmental sustainability, we also need to create economic stability. Yeah. And what that means is that these are not, these cannot be allowed, anything being called the Green New Deal cannot be allowed to be called such if it does not also include project labor agreements with union labor and folks being able to get uh, family sustaining benefits and pay during this process. And the Green New Deal also not must be progressively funded. It must be paid for by those corporations that have created this climate crisis. Yeah. And as such, and as such, this project, this historic project, will not and cannot be something that is anything less than than in support of and by working class people in Vermont and beyond. So the 10,000 members of the Vermont AFL-CIO recognize that we are stronger as a movement together because the corporations want us to be divided. If we stand together 
And if you stand with us in our demand that these be good union jobs that are created out of this project, and if you stand with us when we demand that the funding for such projects be progressive and be uh, not on the backs of working people, then we will stand with you as you fight the good fight for a sustainable, good, economic and environmental future for Vermont and everybody. <laughs> Say united. 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 Our next uh, speaker is not here, so Gwen Holspeth is going to be uh, reading his speech for us. But St Stephen Leslie has been farming for more than 25 years. He is especially fond of draft horses and does all the horse-powered work on the farm. He is the author of many books and magazine articles on draft power and sustainable agriculture. Um, so introducing Gwen in place of him. Thank you. All right, So my name is Gwendolyn Hallsmith, and I'm from Extinction Rebellion, Northeast Kingdom, and the Headwaters Garden and Learning Center in Cabot, Vermont, which was modeled after my friend and mentor, Donella Meadows, Cobb Hill in Heartland. And Stephen is the farmer at Cobb Hill, so it's an honor to read that letter. Farmers everywhere are on the front line of climate change. I began farming in the Upper Valley in 1996. As a dairy and vegetable farmer, I've seen my crops and livestock subject to the increasing stressors of a changing climate. We experience more extreme droughts and precipitation events and less predictable growing seasons. New insects and plant diseases are proliferating in our region. We can salute the current legislature for bringing forward climate initiatives such as the TCI and Vermont Green New Deal, but we must point out that their focus on transportation and energy efficiency is short-sighted. For a rural state like Vermont, land management represents a huge opportunity to mitigate and heal the environmental crisis. The agricultural and forestry sectors are crucial to the solution and must be included in any comprehensive legislation addressing climate change. Yay, Stephen! We can, we can improve farm income and help save the planet by leveraging the state to pay incentives to land managers who use best practices to sequester carbon, protect air and water quality, reduce pesticide use, and transition from fossil fuels. The dairy sector occupies the major of majority of agricultural land in the state of Vermont and is by far the most important sector in economic terms. The working landscape is also a major asset of the tourism sector, which is the leading economic driver of our state's economy. Dairy farmers should be given viable options to diversify, reduce the number of cows, and grow crops such as hemp, medicinal and culinary herbs, and commodity foods such as grain and legumes for humans instead of livestock. Yeah. Yeah. The aim is, the aim of all these incentives should be to reestablish a regional food system. Consumers should be able to buy a full diet of food grown within 100 miles of where they live. No more California lettuce coming to us on jet planes, but rather healthy, organic, and bioregionally produced food eaten with the season. Even if we were to halt all greenhouse gas emissions today, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere will continue to rise for centuries because of how much has already been absorbed by the oceans. As we slow down emissions, the oceans will release CO2 in a process of equilibration. We must halt emissions, but of equal importance is the restoration of our soil reserves worldwide. The most prevalent greenhouse gas is water vapor. There is a fixed amount of water on this planet. Through 10,000 years of soil degradation, we have desertified half of the planet's terrestrial surface and hugely diminished the soil's capacity to hold water. The only way to safely draw down and cool the planet is to rebuild the soil carbon storage. Building the, building the sponge not only sequesters three to 10 tons of carbon per acre, 
It also naturally cools the environment by stabilizing the Earth's hydrologic systems by which she has maintained a livable habitat for increasingly complex life forms for 130 million years. Building the sponge creates resilience for our food systems and also mitigates the damage of flooding and drought. It is the single most important task we can undertake to save humanity and all other species from the ravages of abrupt climate disruption. <laughs> The USDA land-grant colleges and NGOs should promote the concept of the soil carbon sponge as a pivotal component to drawdown and restoration of the Earth's natural cooling hydrologic capacities. Teaching the theory and practice of these concepts to all land managers is crucial. The very best way to sequester carbon and establish food security is to promote regenerative farming practices among every society around the globe. If every individual human being in every village, town, municipality, and city on this planet were dedicated to creating more topsoil through the promotion of small-scale sustainable agriculture, we could sequester all the carbon we need to cool and heal the environment, provide meaningful employment, and feed all the Earth's people. <laughs> Agriculture has been part and parcel of the destruction of the natural world, but it doesn't have to be so. Vermonters can lead the way by embracing regenerative, restorative practices. It's really important to emphasize that we're not just talking about farmland and woodlots. Every citizen, everyone here, everyone in that legislature relies on soil. And so every one of us should be incentivized to become caretakers of the land. No piece of land is too small or insignificant to be worthy of reparation and restoration. We need full citizen participation to create food security and restore biodiversity. I'm almost done. <laughs> the key leverage points for a just transition in agriculture are to reward farmers for ecological services. This, yeah, this isn't only cleaner air, water, and carbon sequestration in soil. It's the production of nutrient-dense food is an ecological service. Establish price parity for farm products to assert, assure, ensure that every farmer and farm worker can earn a living wage. Institute regional supply management of farm products to keep pricing fair and to prevent industry from forcing out small producers. Divert funds that the state currently pays to subsidize tourism to build worker-owned milk bottling plants, artisanal value-added creameries, distilleries, hemp processing, community food processing centers, and more enterprises tied to local food, fiber, and forest harvests. Yes. Five more points. There's five more leverage points. Institute land reform for resettling of climate refugees, many of whom are farmers, and ensure young farmers have access to arable land. Establish cooperative markets and food marketing hubs. Establish biofuel farms to supply regional needs for transitioning tractors off gas and diesel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> biofuel farms will serve as energy hubs for each reason to su supply regional farms with fuel for converted tractors. Only biofuels that can be grown to balance out as carbon neutral will be used. Yeah. Create incentives for electric tractors. Create incentives for electric tractors to be shared between farms. Yeah. And yeah. Stephen's final point, promote draft animal technology. Yeah. Draft animal power can play a significant role again on farms, in the forest, and in the local transport of goods and services. Thank you, Stephen, from Cobb Hill. Thank you, Stephen and Gwen. Uh, next, we have Carmen Richardson Skinder, who goes to Montpelier High School and is part of Extinction Rebellion Youth and the Youth Lobby. Forty years ago, our government had a choice. They knew what the development of fossil fuel industry would do. They accurately predicted the increase of emissions and their impact on the climate. 
They had a choice to, between short-term economic growth and ensuring our generation had a livable future. They chose unsustainable growth. They chose profit and corporations over people. <laughs> For the last 40 years, the federal government has been given this choice. Again and again, they chose economical growth. Frankly, I am terrified of what is going to happen. Right. Of the food shortages, extreme weather, and disease my generation will face. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many kids ask for a livable future because we have no legal representation. I am part of a generation that's future is decided by other people, I, but I can't stand up here and talk only about my generation's fears. The climate crisis is here. Millions of people are already facing the effects of climate change. This is not tomorrow's problem. It's here today, and we see it all over the world. Right. Believe it! Yet, our government refuses to take bold action. They tell us that climate legislation cannot be passed if it costs us. They tell us that they don't have the political willpower. What they don't say is then seven in 10 voters believe that the U.S. should prioritize environmental protection over economic growth. This is not an issue of politics. This is an issue of a government that does not represent its people. Government, Governor Phil Scott says environmental legislation will not be linear. He is correct. The government's complacency has put us back on the brink of causing irreversible damage. Unless there is unprecedented action at all levels of our government, we will have no chance of mitigating the worst effects of climate change. Once again, our government is faced with a choice. We have 10 years to take responsibility and recognize that those least responsible for the climate collapse are and will be facing the worst effects. We have 10 years to reduce emissions by 45% and mitigate the worst effects of the climate crisis. We have even less time to enact the legislation necessary to do this. Right. Or we can continue down the path of complacent and incremental change. The choice is up to them. The people most affected had, have no vote. I ask Phil Scott along with the rest of our legislature to choose to act. I don't trust them to do this themselves. It's time to fight back. We cannot let our... We cannot let our legislative session go by without an, any substantial action. We are beginning to see climate and ecological collapse. So please, starting today, let our legislature know in every way possible that we aren't going anywhere until they start to represent us. Thank you, Carmen. Um, next, we have Esma Ohuni, who is an organizer for the Upper Valley. Uh, growing up as a person of color in the US and an immigrant, she has organized around these important issues to become who she is today. It's cold, but we are here. I want to start off by saying Assalamu Alaikum. As you heard, I am an immigrant, I am a Muslim from Africa. We can't, thank you, we can't talk about climate change if we're not talking about promoting peace. And we can't talk about promoting peace if we don't talk about the United States of America. Which is the antithesis of peace. The U.S. has been raging wars since its inception against brown and black bodies and those who disagree with it. Yes. 
They want to tell us that difference is bad. They want to divide us. So they can stay in power. So they can fill their pockets. The, our politicians and those who do business with our politicians. War is a money-making machine. When we talk about the climate, we can't forget that war destroys this earth and its people. In December, our Congress gave Trump $738 billion for the Department of Defense. That's your money, people. That's your money coming out of our health care system. That's your money coming out of our educational system. That's your money that could be used to address poverty. According to the Bookings Institute, the Department of Defense is one of the largest single consumer of energy in the world. The U.S. military has said that its planes, its boats, its tanks consumes 15 million gallons of fuel a day. Our bloodthirsty drive for oil in our countries and kills people that look like me should end. War causes further environmental degradation. And let me be clear, the wars of the past already have caused destruction in many nations, and it continues to today. We have hundreds of military bases all across the world outside of the United States that are affecting people today. I have a picture. I have a picture here. There's research that shows that even in Iraq today, this has recently come out, where they're looking at people who are born in close to the, the bases, the military bases, and they're finding a lot of anomalies in the birth defects of those babies born in those areas. Our aluminum, our, our, our toxic chemicals from our bombs that don't just go away and that we refuse to clean up after our mess. Jerry, Jerry. We have people struggling with cancer, lung disease, kidney damages, miscarriages, all because of us. This is a quote from a doctor that is in Iraq. Um, and we talked about how we have bases everywhere around the world. And she said, doctors are regularly encountering anomalies in babies that are so gruesome, they cannot even find precedence for them. So I'm gonna end, but before I do, let's just say, we need to get out of everywhere. We need to leave Iran. We need to leave Iraq. We need to leave Palestine and Libya and Uganda and Rwanda and Yemen and Mexico and Venezuela. We need to leave everywhere. And we need to stop targeting bodies, not just abroad, but even in our own country. Yeah. I'd like to end with a chant. And it goes, stop sanctions, end the war, stop the violence on the poor. Right right stop the sanctions, end the war, stop the violence on the poor. Stop the sanctions, end the war, end the violence against the poor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Esma. Our next feature speaker is Gus Speth, who is a retired professor of law at Vermont Law School and a senior fellow at Vermont Law School, the Democracy Collaborative, and the TELUS Institute. During the Carter administration, he served as a member and chairman of the U.S. Council on Environmental Quality. 
Gus has a long career of working at the intersection of government and environmental protection, including providing leadership to many task forces and committees whose roles have been to combat environmental degradation, including the President's Task Force on Global Resources and Environment, the Western Hemisphere Dialogue on Environment and Development, and the National Commission on the Environment. Here he is. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. After that introduction, I know you're thinking this is going to be very boring and <laughs> bureaucratic. Uh, the mic up. Uh, like that? Better? Okay. Um, pick it up. All right. Um, I'm so proud of what the young people have done in this past year. What? What Extinction Rebellion has done, the growth has been phenomenal. And I think there's a deep appreciation in both communities, so to speak, that our climate problem is deeply rooted in the priorities of our current political economy. Here's one example of how deeply it's rooted. You're familiar with the children's climate lawsuit? Yeah. 21 grade school children, some in college now, because the suit was filed several years ago. But they're trying to force the federal government to come up with a decent plan, a comprehensive plan. And they asked me to do a history of all the administration from LBJ to Trump. And uh, so, and, and what they did and didn't do about the climate issue. And the fact is that we knew enough way back 40 years ago in the Carter administration to suggest that we should stop emitting greenhouse gases, put a limit on the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 40 years ago, what we've had in those four decades is the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. <laughs> Governor Scott, I I can imagine on this road to Damascus out here as he's walking from his office over here to give his State of the Union, State of the State address, that he has a conversion experience out there. And, uh, but I doubt it. I wish for it, but I do doubt it, and I think that we need a new governor. That's a frankly political comment, but it's important that we become a political movement. And the last thing I want to say is a bit more about we need all the things that people have been talking about up here. We need the Global Warming Solutions Act, an improved version of it passed. We need other concrete things done. But I believe at the end of a, a long life of working on these issues um, that those who are at the fringe of what we really need, we need to get them. We need to walk across that fringe, incorporate all those great initiatives that people have been talking about here and the Reggie Transportation initial, Initiative and the Global uh, Solutions Initiative. Those are good. They're going to be good things to get done, and Vermont gets to do it. And we need to get beyond this shame of being be behind yeah. our neighboring states. Right. Good yeah. Lord! Yeah. Who could have imagined? But when we get across that fringe, we're at the getting to the heart of the problem. Right. We're getting deeper, and at that heart, what we find is that the systemic priorities of our current political economy war against effective, long-term effective climate solutions. So, so here's my conclusion. The United States will never go fast enough or far enough or do the right things on climate as long as our systemic priorities are ramping up GDP, 
Growing corporate profits, increasing the incomes of the already well-to-do, neglecting the half of America that's just getting by, feeding a runaway consumerism, focusing only on the present moment, facilitating these great bastions of corporate power and helping abroad only modestly or not at all or being downright harmful. So, so we need a two-pronged approach. Fast, rapid deployment of technology and the policy measures to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt and prepare for the changes we can't forestall now because we neglected so much for so long. But the second part is just as important and too often neglected. We've got to begin now to seriously change the system of political economy in which we live and work. And Green New Deal, absolutely, which is the closest approximation to what I just went through as a response to the problems I, I, I just went through. So, system change, not climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Um, our next speaker is David Papirsky, who is speaking as a veteran opposing climate change and global warming, especially as we are on, we are on the brink of war. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I wrote this essay uh, a couple years ago, to, and it, it explains very well the evil connection between racism, poverty, global warming, and war. Hello, everyone. My name is David Papirsky. I am a member of the Vermont Workers' Center and the Vermont Poor People's Campaign. I have been asked to speak today about American militarism and its war economy as I am a homeless vet who presently resides at the Canal Street Veterans Homeless Shelter in Winooski, Vermont. On January 8th of 1977, I turned 18 years of age. I was in my final year of high school and I had joined the Marine Corps. I thought it was a good idea at the time as I wanted to learn some valuable job skills and gain work experience to arise from poverty. At least this is what the Marine Corps recruiter and my society's culture had told me anyway. In retrospect, it became the worst mistake of my life that I compare it to jumping out of the frying pan then into the fire. I should have joined the Peace Corps instead of the Marine Corps. What I found in my six years of service were either vets that had just returned home from Vietnam or new recruits like myself from unhealthy home and school environments who were misled to believe that they would escape from living in poverty by joining the military. Now, at 59 years of age, I find myself homeless for the fourth time. Needless to say, I have never been able to break free from living in poverty. One out of every four homeless people are vets. About 400,000 vets experience homelessness every year. On any given night, there are over 40,000 vets on the streets. Every month, 1,000 vets attempt suicide. Every, every day, tw 20 vets die, die from suicide. That's almost one per hour. Far more than are dying in our endless, senseless, costly, unsuccessful, damaging, and traumatizing wars. <laughs> Countries never win at war. Both sides always lose. Yeah. Al always. Uh, vets typically suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol, and drug addiction. Some of these drugs, the VA itself administers self-blame permission failure 
depression, anger, survivor guilt, and other mental illnesses, physical in injury, and a high number of both women and men are victims of sexual violence by other military personnel. Poverty, high cost of housing, and inadequate health care. Rarely is it ever discussed as to what the individual loses in war, nor is it discussed what our country truly loses. Let's discuss the financial cost of war first. In 2017, the military budget was about $773.5 billion. It is expected to soon climb to over a trillion dollars unless we do something to stop it. This cost does not include uh, foreign aid and extern externalities such as rebuilding a country have, we have just destroyed, utilizing multiple go government contractors. These funds include arming and training a new foreign army to buy our political will. America spends more on our military than the next country, next nine countries combined. Despite, ha <clears throat> despite having only 5% of the world's population, we spend over 50% of the world's total military expenditure. Also understand that all of our tax money that is spent on war is profited upon by the rich. <laughs> Burlington simply does not need 24 nuclear capable F-35s at well over $100 million each. <laughs> this money could be better spent on health care, child care, teachers and nurses salaries, supporting this disabled, affordable housing, higher wages, refugee resettlement, and uh, war refugees, uh, increasing, <laughs> increasing the SNAP program, ending racism, ending poverty, ending environmental destruction, and provide affordable access to college and job training. America could work to heal itself and become a respected leader worldwide instead of perpetually being at war and both hated and attacked by most other countries. I just happened to serve between 77 and 83, one of the few periods in our country's history when America's military had been at peace. Most vets have not been as lucky and are much worse off than myself. They live in the woods or commit suicide. Be being a homeless vet is a direct reflection of America's unhealthy culture and war economy. The twisted culture that encourages an 18 year old to join the military and what amounts to killing other poor people like ourselves in a foreign country because there are no better alternatives here in our country. The most difficult hurdle for a homeless vet to overcome when seeking help from an inadequate system is to trust the very same unhealthy culture that made them homeless in the first place. Then they are rewarded by being reintegrated into an unhealthy society and living in poverty where our country perpetuates this cycle by enlisting new recruits for a never ending war. While vets never really return home from war, some never return from living in the woods while they hope and pray that someone will listen and finally put an end to our war economy. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, now the following is an unsolicited, unsolicited letter of encouragement received from a veteran. We have edited this letter for Lane. I am a military veteran with 23 years of service. I'm writing for this, for this for someone to read, if you wish, so you can learn that there are people allied with you whom you may not suspect would be. 
The ecology of the planet is not a liberal or conservative issue. It is a life issue. <laughs> Human life and all other for life forms. Did you know that the first time the US military did a study on the impact of climate change on national defense was in 1990? You don't have to agree with everything about the military. I sure as hell don't always. But you do need to know that more, more than many other big institutions in our country, the military takes living by the law seriously. Yes, we screw up, we all do, but we are your neighbors and your family members. So reach out to us, both active and veterans. Find allies everywhere, not just among the usual suspects. If we do not extend our allies to every part of our society, we will fail. And we can't fail because this is an, this is an existential fight now. <laughs> In 2011, I co-founded a climate symposium that ran for three years in Stratford. We brought keynote speakers like Bill McKibben, Tim DeChristopher, and Starhawk. But more importantly, we focused organizing people on care for our children's future. And we looked to spiritual and religious communities to do the work. Thanks to Greta Thunberg, we now see this crisis globally through their young eyes. But I want you to also know that Vermont was on that cutting edge a while ago. Vermont must stay on the leading edge of the fight. Every military member, every business person, every church lady, every politician has family, has children. This is what we must remind them of every minute. We are here not for ourselves, we are here for the children. We are here for their future. I am writing to you for my son and my daughter. We must let our children lead. I am speaking to you, Governor Scott. We have every means to make the Green Mountain State even greener. No excuses. No equi equivocation. Sorry, I don't know that word. And Mr. Governor, it makes business sense to change and change decisively. All of us here, all of us here have the will to do this. Do you? We are not your enemies. Join us. And this is from R.B. Breeze, Major U.S. Forest Reserve, who is retired. Uh, part, so we've now reached the time for the one minute elevator pitches from climate and social justice groups. For those who are looking to get involved in bringing about the much needed change, we are all looking for there are many organizations that could use your help. We hope you'll find a group that's a good fit with what you feel most passionate about. Um, Extinction Rebellion, if you could come up here first. Thanks, Rory. Can you just call up 350? You bet. Extinction Rebellion is an apolitical international climate movement that was founded in the United Kingdom a little over a year ago. It's now international. It's rooted firmly here in Vermont. And we're here to tell you and to tell our government that our goal is to use nonviolent direct action to disrupt government, finance, and big business in a meaningful enough way that the government acknowledges our four demands. Our demands are, tell the truth. <laughs> Cut carbon emissions by 2025. Form a people's assembly that holds the government accountable. And in all of our this transition, it must be just. We must especially pay attention to frontline communities. <laughs> I want to thank the Red Brigade who are making their debut here in Montpelier and our climate queens who are also part of Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion has a huge emphasis on nonviolent direct action on, on regenerative culture. If you want to have a good time making a ruckus, come see us. 
Check us out on Facebook, XRVT. I'd like to introduce 350.org. If anyone from 350ZT is here, come give a pitch now. <laughs> Uh, the F-35 group. How many of you here have heard the F-35s? Right. We're going to be getting 20 of them. They each burn 1,500 gallons of fuel an hour. Ver Vermont will be adding two to three million gallons of fuel every year from them. They're the biggest polluter in the state now. They're not included in any of the state's carbon plans, Burlington's plans. They're totally off. We give the military a pass when it comes to global warming. Too many environment, not everybody does. I see signs here, but the big environmental groups give the military a pass. We can no longer do that. We can no longer give our elected representatives a pass. Um, Sanders, Leahy, and Welch are all welcoming them. We need to let them know they're not welcome. Thank you. And, and lastly, there's an, we're organizing a boycott of Burlington International Airport. Please do not use it as long as they host F-35s. Thank you. Is there any other group that would want to come up here and give a little pitch? I'm Dolph Worsing from South Hero. There's a take action group. Oh, there's a, I'm Dolph Worsing from South Hero. There's a take action group in the islands. Uh, as I'm listening to this, it's all great. Uh, but as we deservedly cast blame on our government and uh, polluters and things, let's remember what we can do individually to have our own green environment in our lives. Uh, walk to places, take public transportation, drive a fuel efficient car, uh, carpool. Uh, for food, raise your own garden, compost, uh, have a cold cellar, freeze and can. Stop uh, using plastic. Stop using, yeah, don't buy it, you know, buy your, raise your garden. I don't use plastic in my garden. Um, for your home he heating needs uh, and electricity, use as much as you can solar. You, you all know this, but I'm just saying what we can do while we're waiting for the world to change around us. You can model this for everybody. Uh, solar. Uh, wind, hydro, uh, as you will. If you're if you're a carnivore, you could raise your own sheep, uh, make a hat, um, pigs, you know, stuff like that. So let's not forget what we can do and model for our town. And uh, we can't see the grassroots right now, but they're here. So thank you. Just, I'm from 350 Vermont, Rutland County. I want to thank everyone who came out here today and for everyone who organized this event. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to mention also a uh, subgroup of 350 Vermont is called Mother Up. And it's a group specifically for parents and with young children who are coming together to fight climate change. Um, we meet on the fourth Tuesdays of the month at 530 at the Unitarian Church in Montpelier. Thank you. A lot of community media here today. Uh, great to see the coverage. My name is Todd Tyson. I'm the station manager of Free Vermont Radio down in South Royalton. We carry an environmental show called Green Zine. Listen in. Just remember Free Vermont Radio WFER. An important thing about the legislature, the Climate Caucus has been meeting at the exact same time as this rally. They couldn't change the schedule to be at this rally. I notice uh, someone has just joined us here from the government, and possibly even the next governor of Vermont. Uh, but as the legislature continues, join me and others in keeping an eye on them. We are watching, we are listening, 
And uh, if you want to get in touch with me or other folks that are going to come up to the legislature on a regular basis, sit in on important committees and make sure that the people's voices are heard. Uh, join me. Great, great day here. <laughs> My name is Susan Hodges. I live in South Stratford, and I just wanted to say there's a lot of very small communities in Vermont. And just because you're small doesn't mean you're off the hook. We have a small group in Stratford. We've had signs out, climate change signs out on the main road through town uh, every Friday since September 20th, and we're we've got a climate uh, emergency resolution up in our town meeting coming up, and we're doing things to help spread the word in, in our community and anyone else that wants to come. So you can do that in your community, even if it's really small. We only have a thousand people in all of Stratford. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Sassman. I am with Indivisible Callus in Lean Left Vermont. There is certainly a lot of work to be done here in Vermont. And at the same time, we're all gonna be subject to what happens in Washington, D.C. And Lean Left Vermont and Indivisible Callus and many other groups in the state are working hard at helping change the makeup of Congress and state houses in other states because they really affect what's happening. So this year, we have to take back the White House, we have to take the Senate, we have to keep the House, and we have to affect change at the state level where there's a massive effort to suppress the vote and elect a disproportionate number of Republicans nationally based on gerrymandering and other forms of voter suppression. So you can check us out at leanleftvermont.org, indivisiblecallots.org, and, uh, and we can help you direct, direct you to another local group if that's what you want to do. Thank you. I'm Laura Rose from uh, Montpelier, and I want to encourage you all to get uh, an eye on your local government. Many of them are um, changing zoning, not prevent, pr protecting our waterways and our slopes, uh, encouraging development where there shouldn't be any right here in Montpelier that's happening they're changing the zoning please keep an eye on what they're doing in your local representation thank you thank you so it sounds like we're saying where we're from. I'm David Zuckerman, I'm from Heinsberg, and who we're with, and I'm with all of you. And I'm not gonna speak any longer than anyone else. I just wanna say that I know people here have been advocates and fighting for the environment and for climate change for many, many decades. And I'm so excited to have both longtime fighters and all of the new fighters who are with us working to change the discussion because we have no time left. We have to take action and we have to be big in our action. We need to make policies that are moving forward on reducing CO2 emissions and making sure people can live in their homes and have decent standards of living because the two are not opposed to each other. And we're often like put in this place where you can either have you know, houses and money and wealth and glorious whateverness, or you can have a planet. Um, well, first of all, without a planet, we're kind of in trouble. And as a farmer, I felt it last year. We were down 35,000 pounds of food on our farm because of the drought last summer. And we're seeing it in Australia, and we're seeing it in Paradise, California, and all over California. We're seeing it in Nebraska this spring. Without a planet and a sane environment, we don't have food. I mean, this is pretty fundamental, and we have to do our part here, and so thank you for being here and being loud. I, I also have to tell you that I'm the parliamentarian in there in half an hour, and I have to be mean if you're loud in there, so I'm sorry, but that's, I do respect the system tremendously, so being, well, I'm sorry. I think 
That's okay. You don't have to respect the system, but I have to do my job. And um, but I, what I will urge you, and I know many of you are dedicated to being here day in and day out and talking to your legislators, even our good ones, to remind them that this can't be let go for another year and let go for another year. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Okay. So for those who are staying for the pandem pandemonium event, please find a pandemonium wrangler. Uh, with a red armband. They will provide further, further instructions about the pandemonium accompaniment, accompaniment to Governor Scott at two o'clock. Um, between now and then, we are able to warm up in State House room 11, and we also have food provided from the Red Hand Bakery, Extinction Rebellion Vermont, and Capitol Grounds, uh, right up there. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Room oh. 11 is not available. Okay. Room 11 is not available. It was reserved for tomorrow. Oh, so, no. but okay. well, there's <laughs> hot coffee, pastries, blankets, and warm socks right under the Christmas tree. Please avail yourself of them. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And we have we have one more comment from Gwen right here. So yay for the pandemonium! Woohoo! We are gonna continue to have a pandemonium for this legislature later today and every Friday. So I'd encourage you if you're willing to come a little bit later and bang some pots and pans, let's get in touch with the people here and we'll give you further instructions. So we've been working in this legislature and it's time they started listening to us. So we're going to make some more noise. 